afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Nimble Evaluations in International Development session. My name is Javier, and I'll be chairing this session. Uh, right before we begin, um, I'd like to mention that Rachel, unfortunately, could not, join, could not join us this afternoon. She had an emergency in government. And stepping in is Laura and Johannes, who I will be introducing in just a few seconds. Uh, before we begin, just a bit of a session overview. We are going to focus on a broad question. How can nimble evaluations contribute to make research more fit for use by policy and change makers? This is the question that convenes us today. And to get into it, we will devote an initial 10 minutes to an introduction, then a bit over half an hour to a discussion and conversation among our participants, and then the final 15 minutes to questions and answers from the audience. Um, I'll remind you to use the slide.do app. Remember to go in there, insert the event code, search for the St. James Room, and state your questions there. And remember also to vote on the questions of others so that the questions with the most votes can be up higher in the list. Um, I'd like to introduce the people that are joining us this afternoon. Professor Dean Carlin, he's Professor of Economics and Finance at Northwestern University as well as the co-director of the Global Poverty Research Lab at the Buffett Institute at the same university, the founder of Innovations for Poverty Action, and most recently a co-author with Mary Kay Gogarty of the Goldilocks Challenge, Right Fit Evidence for the Social Sector. Dean's research agenda focuses on using randomized evaluations to learn what social policies work, and what, what, which ones do not, and why. And he has covered a variety of topics in developing countries, examining efforts around financial inclusion for the poor and charitable, charitable fundraising, among others. Thank you for being with us, Dean. Johannes Haushofer, Associate Professor of Psychology and Public Affairs assistant, at Princeton. Assistant. Now assistant. No, well, no, uh, sorry, I said more. associate. <laughs> excuse I'll me. take it. No. Excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Almost there. <laughs> yeah, no. almost there, almost there. <laughs> Assistant professor um, of psychology and public affairs at Princeton. Um, his research lies at the intersection of neurobiology, behavioral economics, and development economics. Um, his research has explored whether poverty has particular consequences um, in psychology and, and neurobiology, and whether these consequences in turn affect economic behavior. Thank you for being here, Johannes. And finally, Laura. Laura is Senior Advisor in the Home Affairs and International Programs team at the Behavioral Insights team, where she is responsible for work in France and Bangladesh. And in recent years, he has been working in impact, on impact evaluations in Mexico, Peru, India, and Bangladesh. Thank you for being here, Laura. Thank you. And myself, uh, I am Javier. I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer and co-founder of Radical. We are a social and environmental enterprise devoted to tackling behavioral challenges for the circular economy. Um, and I have been working for the past four years in the Colombian government, leading the public innovation team at the Ministry of Planning in Colombia. Also a pleasure to be here today. So as a means of introduction, let's, let's first ask what nimble evaluations, before asking what nimble evaluations are about, why are we asking whether research should be more fit for use? Uh, there is this apparent gap between research and action that happens for change, both in government and in entrepreneurship. I have witnessed, personally witnessed, so many PDFs and PowerPoints that end up gathering dust in hard drives. Um, Incredible amounts of money poured into research efforts, even commissioned by decision makers that then do not use uh, the results of the research efforts. And this gap can be tied to at least three different dimensions. The resource and time constraints that projects face in practice sometimes diverge from what the research actually is requiring. Um, Questions about relevance in context, so how the decision-making processes in when action is happening for change require this question about the research being relevant in, in the context in which it's operating. 
And then the question of generalizability comes on, on the table. When is it the case that research that has shown results in another context is actually relevant in a new one? And finally, the need for getting timely and useful, truly useful and timely feedback. So there sometimes is this gap between when the research is ready and published and when the decision makers and change makers are making their decisions and whether the feedback that is coming from this research is actually a good fit uh, for the organization or the government making those decisions. So we have this question about fitness and nimble evaluations. It's one of the po possible answers to uh, this very broad question. We believe the term was coined by you, Dean. We wanted to check if that was actually the case circa 2017. <laughs> But that's what the archaeology of the term shows. Okay, I, I, I didn't know. <laughs> They've also been called rapid fire evaluations, um, and they have the following key distinguishing features. Uh, they have a typical focus on operational questions, uh, and they are therefore distinct from impact evaluations in as much as they tackle learning, monitoring and learning in the operational context. Take, for example, take-up questions such as buying, accepting, clicking, viewing, or messaging. Uh, their nimble evaluations are going to focus on measuring short-term results instead of longer-term outcomes. And they are going to be using readily available data, especially administrative data, uh, or data that is gathered via digital sources that make it then faster than traditional randomized control trials, and also cheaper, especially if there are no surveys involved, right? Um, so let's take this as, a, as an initial definition, which we will be discussing in, in our conversation immediately afterwards. It's actually taking from your content, Dean. Um, and as a, as a means of an example, uh, part of the work that we did in Colombia together with the Behavioral Insights team and with support from the Inter-American Development Bank, was focused on social monitoring of school meals provisions in the country. And the project that we carried out, had this, the intervention had a component that used SMS messages. Um, and what we did was, before carrying out a larger scale RCT to measure the impact of the intervention, we implemented a winner stays on design to understand what the design of the SMS messages should be to um, get to the highest, the highest probability of response from a parent. So we wanted to ask parents of children in schools, hi, your child today should have eaten X or Y or C at the school. Ask him or her, was this the case? Reply yes or no for free. But we wanted to try out whether personalizing the messages, which was an enormous effort, made sense. And so we carried out this rapid very rapid randomized control trial with a smaller sample of parents. And we realized that personalizing had indeed a significant effect. So we went for personalization. Mm -hmm. After that, we tried it and see if we mentioned three ingredients of the food that was served at school versus just one ingredient in the message. And somewhat surprisingly, mentioning three ingredients um, caused more replies from parents than mentioning just one. Then whether sending the messages in the morning or the afternoon was, had also a significant effect, and this ran contrary to what the government unit working with SMS messages told us. They swore that it was better to send the SMS messages in the afternoon. We insisted on evaluating whether that was the case, and our results showed otherwise for this context and this question. And then finally, whether uh, mentioning a content that pointed to individual effects had higher responses, as was indeed the case, than a message that pointed to a more social reference. To have, in the end, a message that looked like this. It's in Spanish, but it says, Hi, Marta. Today, Maria, so the daughter, should have eaten meat, broccoli, and rice. Did she eat that? Without a cost reply, yes or no. And so this was you know, an implementation of the nimble evaluation idea in the very operational question of how to design SMS messages in this intervention. And I'd like to invite um, now Dean to get into our conversation. 
Could you tell us about an example that comes from your work about nimble evaluations? Sure. Um, so, um, so the example I was going to give comes from savings. Um, we've done a lot of work to try to mobilize savings around the world. Um, sometimes that work started in kind of to, to draw the comparison to some of the to changing product design, to changing things to be like commitment savings or rolling out new highly liquid savings accounts with lower fees, things of this nature. Those are all long-term studies. We're asking broader questions. Where does the money come from, for instance? We want to know, like, if you're getting them to save more in one account, are they saving more or are they just saving more in that account and saving less elsewhere, right? Really important question for policy. Um, but as you know, lots of financial institutions have clients. They have bank accounts. And, and there's an aspiration to just say, well, you know, I'd love to know that question about the impact on households and where the money's coming from to really understand what's happening differently. But meanwhile, I do have some short run, highly you know, nimble things I can do. And I just want to find out whether sending text messages and what those messages say will lead them to save more. Right? And this doesn't get at the welfare question. It doesn't tell you the impact. Like I said, it could be that you're just getting them to save more, and they're saving less somewhere else. We'll never know. Right? Um, well, we'll know if they're saving less at the same bank, because we might be able to track their other bank accounts. But that's about the extent of what you can learn. Right? And I think that's actually one of the biggest lessons to remember about nimble evaluations in this way we're talking about it. And it's actually one of the most common struggles that we face whenever I'm talking to a group, is they always, most places will often say, great, learn to do that nimble evaluation. Now please tell me the impact of this on households and children. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, you can't get all those other questions in there as well. We're not just, a nimble evaluation is not just answering the same questions and figuring out how to do it nimbly. It's, it's diff asking different, more limiting, less exciting, to be perfectly blunt, questions. But they're short run, they're immediate, they're usable, they're actionable. And they can be really important. And if you have a long-term theory of change that, you've un that you understand, then, then it can be, you know, you can, you, can, you can bank on it, no pun intended. You can say, like, look, I, I'm going to move the needle in this short-run step of getting people to save more. I'm not going to worry about what's happening later down the chain. It would be the same thing as doing, like, an education intervention and saying, look, I don't need every education intervention to track children for 20 years to look at their um, household income later. I know, I know there's lots of things that show me that more education leads to more income. So that it means I don't need to measure income for every study. Right? So I can, I can look at short run changes and then feel comfortable that there's a long run theory of change which will kick in. So that's the same thing we're doing with, with savings. And so we sent off a whole bunch of text messages. One of the reasons for that example is that because we, we did it under the pretense, the first time I did it was under the pretense of a goal savings account where everybody had a goal. And so those are five different people, kind of different goals. Right, which which um, leads to a second point that I just want to leave here, which is one of the you know the the upsides and the downsides of nimble evaluations is that in a lot of instances you're dealing with really clean data and lots and, and in many cases really large samples because you're dealing with the administrative side of some operations of, of some program or some firm, and so that actually gives you lots of opportunity to start testing. Um, for heterogeneity, test for understand not just like what's the best message, but how do you write, how do you do the right pairing using the data you have to know what the right message is for the right person, and that's a very different question. And you know, if you think about people's goals for savings, you could easily imagine how the right message might very much depend on what their goal is. Are they saving for education? Saving for health? Are they saving for a rainy day? Are they saving something they can picture in their own mind? or for something that may or may not happen, like a rainy day. Right? There's a very big difference in the psychology of that, of that decision-making process, and that might lead to a very different prescription. And so, so we, we did these tests in aggregate, and we found some big effects from reminding people to save. So it was actually very successful from a financial institution perspective, showed that it generated mobilized savings. But a lot was left on the table for understanding, like, OK, what type of message works better? And how do we write that right prescription? And can we actually get people to change long-term behavior um, through, um, through a sequence of, of text messaging, which can be tracked using administrative data, but obviously requires a little more patience because you want to ask long-term questions, you'd have to wait. Doesn't mean you need survey data for that, but you, you, you'll need to at least wait. And we are seeing some evidence of being able to move the needle in some instances on habit formation which is a huge, a huge win, and, and, but most instances we cannot. 
Um, we're, the more tangible we're finding the messages are, the more likely they are to, to switch um, long-term habit formation. So that's, that's a very sketchy summary of the results so far. <laughs> Wonderful um, example. Yeah. We'll get back to the upsides and downsides of nimble evaluations in a moment. But before that, I think Johannes. Yep. Okay. Yes. Hi, everyone. Can, uh, you give us a, can you give us another example and give us more details about how you feel about nimble? Yeah, good. Um, so it's a little bit unlikely for me to be here, partly because Rachel Glenister was really supposed to be here, but she got called in because the government realized what they need in the current situation as an expert on developing countries. <laughs> and then the, the other reason is, the other reason it's surprising is because very few things I do in life are nimble. Um, this was first noted by my dance partner in 10th grade, but it <laughs> extends to the research that I do. So mostly I use randomized field experiments often run through IPA, the NGO that Dean founded. Um, and so both the methodolo methodology is traditional RCT methodology, but also the interventions are often heavy-handed interventions. So I've done a lot of work on cash transfers, a little bit of work on poverty graduation programs. These are very, you know, full-on interventions that don't really come under the heading of Nimble. But one context in which it's increasingly coming up now is in the context of the other research interest and the area that I originally came from, which is experimental and behavioral economics, um, and lab experiments. So that was my, my background in, in neuroscience and, and originally in economics, um, is running these experiments in the lab. And um, it, it seemed to me that there wasn't really a lot of that happening in developing countries, and there wasn't a lot of that informing uh, randomized experiments or generally policy uh, uh, experiments. And so, um, also, with the help of IPA, uh, we set up this place called the Pizarro Center for Behavioral Economics, which originally was uh, a lab for behavioral economics. In, it started in Kenya. It's now in a bunch of other countries. And um, that also started as a not very nimble place. It was a, a standard behavioral economics lab where you have a room with a bunch of computers, and people come and participate in experiments. Um, but it's recently taking a turn in the nimble direction uh, in two senses. Uh, the first is that it's finally started to do what I originally was hoping it would do, which is to inform, to use small lab experiments to inform the design of large randomized evaluations. And so the picture that you can see here is an example uh, where, where this happened. And this isn't the study that I did. That was the staff at Busara together with a partner in India called CSBC. Um, the interest here was to increase uh, the use of iron folic acid. So there's lots of anemia in India, especially if you're pregnant. That's a problem, and you're supposed to take these pills um, that help you with that. And uptake of these pills is very low. And there were a number of options on the table for what might potentially help increase uptake. Um, but if you implement those in a large RCT, that's very costly. There's a, you know, if you have five or six things you're thinking about, that costs a lot of money. And so. The approach here was to say, let's test this very humbly and easily in a lab-type setting first and find the two or three top candidates. And then those get tested in a large field RCT. And so that's what happened here. Because it's hard to get pregnant women uh, to come to the lab, the lab came to them. So this is a bus. This is also not super nimble, but buses aren't very nimble. But we, we built a lab into a bus. Uh, and that bus came to people, and people got invited into this bus, and they got exposed to a number of different, essentially, marketing campaigns for these tablets. Um, and then two weeks later, we called them and we asked them how much, well, not, again, not we, this is really something I had very little to do with. The team here called people and asked them how much they remembered from these campaigns, uh, how much they were willing to pay for these tablets, and so on. And so then two candidate interventions emerged as the most promising, and those were the ones that then got tested in a large standard field RCT. And so that's one sense in which I think we can make many of the interventions that we test, or many of the tests of interventions, more nimble. Um, and then the other is, um, 
a direction in which Posara has only recently started moving. We were at the point where we had been growing way too fast for many years, and we had to decide a little bit in which direction we wanted to go. And the realization that we had was that there is often a disconnect between what organizations and policymakers need and what academics are able to do for them. So organizations need solutions that are very tailored to their problems, and they need them very quickly, whereas academics have their pet interests that they want to test regardless of whether the problem really is appropriate for that sometimes. And they also take months and years to do this. And so the, the new direction which we've tried to take, and this is obviously not entirely new in the world, but it's new for us, um, is to uh, try to be a better link between academics and implementing organizations. So have a roster of academics, essentially, who can be called upon very quickly to help with specific problems that organizations have. And we've only just started piloting that. Um, but that's the second sense in which we've sort of moved in the, in the nimble direction. So maybe I'll stop here. That's a powerful point about the potential misalignment between the interests and incentives of implementing organizations and researchers. I'm sure we'll, we'll get back to that too, to get a bit into more detail on that. And then insist upon the, how the potential, a potential application of nimble ev evaluations is informing the design of interventions for larger scale RCTs. <coughs> so, Laura, one more example. So, Please. Uh, yes, it's also quite surprising for me to be on this panel first, because as you know, I was not supposed to be here, but also because uh, I'm both in my capacity at BIT, but also in my previous life. Uh, Dean, I don't even know if you know this, but gave me my first job at IPA when I was 18. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is, this is, you know, everything goes in loops like this. Um, but so this is work that is, I did not do, my colleagues in my team, the international development team did, and actually uh, Bruce is over there at the back, where some of our colleagues, I don't know if they're here, from Indonesia, uh, if you see them around the conference, say hi, because they have uh, helped us run what has been, I think, to date, our largest <coughs> ever trial with over 11 million uh, participants. And that would still, and the reason why we wanted to put this one up there is to tell you Mainly two things is first, while at BIT we're very much uh, interested and in the business also of understanding impact on things, the social impact of all the interventions that we work on with our partners and that we put in the field. We are also, you know, the core of our business is to work with governments mostly, but organizations invested, you know, in social programs more broadly and how to make their programs, their interventions, their policies more efficient how to improve the delivery and the design of policy. And so this is where a lot of our work is actually enters this idea of nimble evaluations where we try to do things that are both, you know, that fit within the systems that governments and organizations use, try and be as quick as possible and deliver on, on problems that they have. Typically here, so this is working with the tax office in Indonesia and who were facing a problem that a lot of tax offices have uh, which is that a lot of people, a large majority of people, were paying either just on the deadline, which crashed all the servers, or late. And so they wanted to work with us to try and see if we could encourage people to pay a bit earlier, and so try and move forward the filing date. This might seem, you know, quite small in terms of something to try and shift as a behavior, but if you think in terms of, you know, the fiscal consequences of being able to bring in this type of money, and also just kind of improving the efficiency of really, really important public services. Um, so we worked with them, and, and this is, you know, for those of you who are familiar with BIT, you have been around, uh, this, this is really quite classical of a, of a trial for us, which is also why I, I thought it was interesting to put up. Uh, we worked with them to design a series of six emails that were sent to, so 11.1 million taxpayers. And the, we were trying to encourage them to uh, file two weeks ahead of the deadline. And so we tested, so the control group which received no emails and then the series of emails and then measured uh, whether they were filing at the point where we asked them to. <coughs> we found that the commitment email which asked them to decide and declare at what date they would uh, do their tax filing uh, worked best in this scenario. So those of you who are familiar with impact evaluation are gonna tell me 11.5 million observations, no doubt you got something significant. Uh, <laughs> If we didn't, we would have known that really it was all the same. At that point, it would probably have been a convincing zero, uh, but which it was not. Um, and so, you know, it, it might seem small in terms of, of marginal effects, but still, if you think again in terms of, 
you know, embedding this type of culture of they are going to send emails, they do this routinely, and if you start the culture of constantly thinking about, okay, what is the best way to communicate? What is the best way to move people? And this is where, you know, what's important for us in the way we work is combining both this idea of constant, quick trialing of things, but also the nimble intervention part of things, which we were talking about earlier. But so, you know, the intervention that we set in here are just ch changes in one sentence. Same thing around, you know, the types of SMS, types of things. All the, all, we're testing really, really small changes that we know from the large literature on behavioral science can have actually quite large impact or even disproportionate impact if you think of the cost of the changes on, on actual behavior. And so, so this is why I wanted to, to open with this example because it's, it's really a good, great demonstration of, of the culture of, of the way we work in trying to, to embed this within the, the kind of working culture of our partners. You can, you can make your treatment effects much bigger if you just scale the right axis from 20 to 30 percent. So, yeah. <laughs> so this, is, this is an argument we have a lot. And we have decided that all our axes should be scale at zero. Um, but this is an argument. We've talked about this for probably four hours. <laughs> I think you made, you made a great point about this idea of embedding nimble ev evaluations as part of a culture of constant monitoring and learning in an organization. I know you've made this point in an article in the social innovation, Stanford Social Innovation Review Dean, and so I want to take a step back and, and get back to you and ask, why go nimble? Mm -hmm. uh, how did you identify the need to do nimble evaluations in the first place? Could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, uh, look, I'm all for measuring longer term impact, but there's a lot of situations where we're leaving a lot of important operational questions on the table and not getting them answered well. And that's not just uh, for internal operations. It's also for external learning. It's for, it's for some other country who wants to do something like this. What's the, what's the generalized lesson that we can take away from this about what's going on for households in, 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 in Indonesia as they make these decisions, right? So, I mean, there's certainly thinking that can go into that. This is not a practitioner versus academic tension on that dimension. Um, there are some areas where there, that is tension, but I don't think there's a, there needs to be a tension there necessarily. Um, there's just, um, I think, you know, it's great to have lots of attention to long-run impacts and questions about that, but we can't lose sight of the fact that just improving operations can go a long way to improving the program and helping us understand why something's working in the first place and how to you know, that does actually help uh, get a better and richer understanding of what is actually driving the, the program overall. So it's not... And you think researchers can have an interest in this operational, improving absolutely. operational? Absolutely. You know, no, no, I mean, ab absolutely. I don't think there's... The, the, the tension for... Um, the tension, I think, that happens for researchers versus um, practitioners or implementers is not about nimble versus not. It's about whether the lessons that you're going to learn from that are going to be useful for other organizations. Mm -hmm. that's, I think, and, and that's what a researcher wants. A researcher wants something that has some generalized lesson, that is testing some theory, and that can be used somewhere else. And I'll give you a very simple example of, you know, very practical. What I mean by this, um, I'll give you an example of one we did, which did not fall into what I would call research. Um, we hoped it would, but it didn't. Um, and it was, it, was, um, it was work with the nudge unit, actually, at the, in the US government. Um, and it was partnering up with the US Department of Agriculture. They were sending off mass mailers to try to promote to small farmers in America using this loan program that was part of the USDA that was being underused. And um, we had all these grand ideas when we started off about testing out how we described the loan program as furthering markets or subsidizing farmers, and, and also crisscrossing that with politics, um, whether we describe this program as created by, um, um, by Bush or, I mean, or, or kind of furthered by Obama. And so we had all these kind of fun questions we were interested in to understand something about how this plays out um, and why farmers may or may not adopt this program and what it tells us about their perceptions of it, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, we ended up with we, we lost the ability to do all of these subtests that we wanted through the, through the process. And what ended up getting tested was two different letters, which were different in lots of dimensions. 
and um, we had two different rounds of testing, and there were so many things that changed from one round to the next that all I can tell you is the letter worked in one round and didn't in the other, and I can give you seven reasons why that may be the case, and I have no idea what, what the right answer is. It's end of story. Right? And so was that useful for them? Well, yeah, they learned not to do one, and they learned to do the other. And so they can keep doing that, and they can probably do better. But you know, they were good with that. They kind of worked, and they kind of learned something to do that improved their take-up rates. But you know, we didn't we didn't feel like I learned it. I didn't learn anything other than a process lesson about about this. Um, it's not there was nothing. There's no generalized lesson here about why are farmers taking out loans or not, and how do they perceive government programs that are lending, and and how does the way the loan program is described change their perceptions of whether it's good for them or not to participate and things like this, which are you know, useful questions for understanding why people participate in government programs or not. But we didn't get any of that. So that's, that's where the divisions, I think, happen. Not on nimbleness versus not. Um, that's Johannes, to deepen this discussion then, so in your experience, when is going nimble more appropriate, when less? You already mentioned the idea of making it as an input for larger RCTs. Is that the main application in your mind? Is that the appropriateness? When, when is it good to go nimble? When is it not? I could imagine that it's trickier, and maybe this is following on from Dean's example, it might be trickier to do when you have less of a prior of what the mechanisms are and you want to understand those first. Why do people engage or not engage, engage in a particular behavior? Um, whereas in situations where you're already have pretty strong priors about that. You've diagnosed the problem and you think you understand it fairly well. You might be able to rely on existing research. So for example, if we think that we're in a situation where present bias is the root of the problem that we're dealing with, there's so much work that's already been done, including very good experiments that understand mechanisms very deeply. Maybe we can just take that and apply it. And th at that point, it can probably be very nimble. We know what the intervention should look like, some form of commitment device, potentially. Um, and that we can just stick in there and it's going to be successful. Where in other situations that might be, we might have fewer priors or be less certain about them. So, you know, how do we get, uh, how do we increase the use of sanitary pads? There's a million reasons ranging from cost to uh, social factors, the stigma of buying them or whatever. And so, in those situations, it might be really tricky to be nimble because you first want to understand the mechanisms. That's not to say that in those situations, you couldn't also do just a um, throw everything at the problem, but then it would become a very large study. And so each individual arm maybe is very nimble, but the, the project as a whole would be much larger. So I would say where we, we know the mechanisms really well. Yes. Great. Laura, what do you see as the main downsides of going nimble? What do we lose? I mean, I, I don't know if it's a question of losing, but it's, it's a question of, you know, there's basically these two kind of big ways. I mean, there are lots of kind of intersections between the two, but if you, if you, and that's, I think, the problem we have very often when we communicate about the types of things we can do with partners is there's this idea of impact evaluations. And so what we will tell you is this is the effect on education. This is the effect on income. This is, you know, if you increase the minimum wage, that's what's going to happen. Um, and then there's, there's this other thing, which is a lot more around using, and that's at least that's the way I like to see the nimble evaluations, is how, how can we use data to, to try and improve the monitoring and the development of policy and how it's put in place. Mm -hmm. And that can be either it can feed into a larger you know, trial where we want to try. I mean, the minimum wage example is a terrible example. But anyways, we want to try to stick with it. Uh, we want to try what happens if you increase minimum wage, and then you know we want to see different ways of communicating about the increase. And so you need to have like a nimble thing that fits onto a larger program evaluation, kind of evaluation of public policy in the classical sense. Um, and so they're just two different things, right? And so you just have to be really clear kind of what it is you want to achieve. And I think this is what we struggle with a bit when we communicate about what we can do with, with policymakers, with you know, organizations, when they say, you know, oh, we, we know we need an RCT. You know, and there's kind of this idea of everyone now knows that you, you want an RCT, but, but an RCT that achieves what? Uh, are you trying to achieve you know, increasing take-up of something that you know works? You just, you, know, you just have this kind of like 
identified behavioral problem for which we have, as, as Johannes was saying, kind of ideas of, of what feeds into that problem? Or, or is the idea that you have this new program that you have no idea whether it's gonna work or not, and then you know, it's a different beast? So if you're telling me, you know, uh, if you call me into a meeting and you say, oh, we're developing uh, this new, you know, teaching, this new kind of teaching program on how to train micro entrepreneurs, and it's this new thing that has lots of psychology into it and all this, and we want to know if it works on profit, then there's just, Nimble's just not the right tool, right? Nimble goes to feed into it, but it's just, so it's just a question of figuring out what tool you need. Um, just sorry to finish. <laughs> Because I guess there's another thing, and it, it goes to the idea of like how we think about interventions as well, and a bit to both of your points. Um, to the generalizability point, is very often when we have to make compromises in working on policy evaluations, we, uh, we sometimes end up kind of you know, combining things and throwing, throwing a lot of things, th combining a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of psychological levers that we know we have, or incentives, or communications tools, and things like and, and we combine all these into a treatment because we just try and go for social impact, the largest effect we can think of. And so this is when you lose generalizability, potentially, because you just can't disentangle. And so this is where you have to also think about, you know, am I looking for, am I putting myself as a consultant, and I'm going to look for you at this moment in time, in this place, in space, the best solution that I can think of for you? Or am I looking for something that I want to be able to generalize? And I think this goes to Dean's point about, you know, what, what is the role of the researcher and, and kind of try and find ways to do both at the same time so that everyone's incentives are aligned. Yes. Um, Thank you. I would like to remind you, we already have a few questions um, to go on slide.do and vote on those that you find most interesting. We will get to the audience questions in just a few minutes. But before that, uh, just to give you a lead, uh, Laura touched upon communication and collaboration uh, in, connect, in, in connection with nimble evaluations. Johannes and Dean, what, what do you feel? Do you feel that going nimble implies new ways of communicating research, new ways of collaborating? What is needed in terms of communication and collaboration to make nimble go the right way and not the wrong one? Um, no, it, I mean, look, you do, you know, we academics do have a bad, reputation, which is well-deserved uh, for, you know, um, being slower than, than people, you know, sometimes want. That's, um, you know, sometimes some people are faster than others, but like, you know, the, that's just a, a reality. And so I think it is important if one is engaging in any sort of iterative process that it is done with a partnership where there's staff who are, you know, ready to, to roll out round two, round three, round four, and are not going to sit there and wait for the academic to finish teaching, to sit down and write out their theoretical model and think through it and then digest it and then give a few seminars and then come back and say, now I'm ready to do another round. You just can't do that. You have to, you have to, you know, let the, let the iterative process happen and have the right staff in place for doing that. Um, it does get a little bit to one of the, you know, one of the bigger angst that I have the few times I've gotten, in, not, not, I guess it's more than, more than a few with corporate entities, but it is, you know, a lot of times when people talk about nimble RCTs, what they end up doing in some instances is um, going through very quickly the kind of the process of setting up the research. And now I'm going to sound like a really like dorky academic, but like the reality is when you rush these things and they're not done right, sometimes you get really you do it, mistakes happen. Quite, and I'm always amazed at sometimes when we're engaging with corporate entities, which we thought were like super polished, and we thought we could be from afar and just have them give us their data, and they told us they're running this test. Was that great? Give it to me. Did one charitable giving experiment with a charity in the U.S. that had a highly professional direct marketing firm running their A/B tests, and they handed me. It was actually a test. It speaks a little bit to the communications point. We were testing whether telling people about the impact via a randomized trial helps raise more money for the charity. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so if you tell your donors, if you tell your donors, we did a randomized evaluation to measure our impact, and we had positive effects on this and this and this. Does that do better than a story? Um, about an individual. Well, in, in fairness, the first one also told a story about an individual, just added, and we also measured impact, right? Um, and they sent me the first batch of results, and it had a, um, something like a 7% giving rate in the control group, and about a 17% giving rate in the treatment group. 
And this is from direct marketing of physical letter. And I, I you know, hadn't been doing 30 years of these experiments, but I had been doing enough to know that that's wrong. <laughs> that there's no, I don't care what the treatment is, there's no way changing two paragraphs is going to bump your, your giving rate from 7% to 17%. They swore up and down, it was randomized. We dug in and it turned out what they did is they randomly gave everybody in the treatment group who would get, every, Everybody who had given in the past year, they randomly assigned to the treatment group. <laughs> um, and everybody who had given years two and earlier, and not really, gave to the control group. And there we go. Um, um, you know, we had another one with a millions and millions of observations. I think it might actually be the largest study I've ever done. It was with an online multiplayer game. And they, their random assignment was by a user ID the last digit, which was sequential, when you sign up for the game and you get your user ID and it just goes, so it was kind of like close enough. And, um, and so, because you know, over the entire history, everything was just literally like millions and millions of users, and the final digits just sequential. So it seemed reasonable and treatments went to zero, one, two, and then another treatment was, the last digit was three, four, five, like that. Um, at some point, they changed their system, and, and it's something they, about the new uh, account IDs had a two to the x function in it somehow. The bottom line is, you no longer had odd numbers. <laughs> Turns out, it made a big difference in, in the random assignments, and we ended up with more of one treatment and not of another, and biased specifically towards people who'd signed up more recently than previously. And again, we got this treatment effect that was you know, it was there, it wasn't massive, but it was big enough that it made me scratch my head, and then we looked at the pre-data, and we saw a T-stat of like 70, and I knew enough then to know something's off. So the point is, when you just, nimble doesn't mean, like, Other questions. it's easy to make mistakes, like you still gotta be careful, and these are not, these are not mistakes where I'm not being a dorky academic to say this is, ruins the academic paper. Like, no, this is actually, ruins the decision-making process too when the randomization is not done right. And so you gotta be careful. Nimble does not mean ignore all the technical history and advice and protocols that the academics want. It means figure out how to do that without, um, on your own, you know, with your staff, um, or the staff of BIT, or, or IPA, or Brusara, whoever else. Johannes, briefly, you have any thoughts on collaboration or communication through the perspective of Nimble evaluation? No, actually, I have nothing to add. <laughs> Great. I want to hear more stories so, from Dean. <laughs> I'd like to prompt the next story by asking the audience a question via the polling system. Um, so if you, can, if you can log on slide.do, you will see the following question. If we put it up, then it's there. People, there's live updating of the voting, right? Yes, it was. The, there you go. There's live updating. So the question is the following. What do you think is the key reason why there aren't more people using nimble evaluations? First, policy and change makers aren't aware of their existence or benefits. Incentives for researchers aren't aligned. It is happening, but it's not being publicized enough. It is difficult to get funding for it. Or policy and change makers are struggling to find people with the right capabilities. So please vote and we will invite <coughs> our speakers to discuss We've, on the reason that is most highly voted. I can just, I mean, this all assumes, I'm, I realize I, I co-wrote these options with you, but the, this all assumes that you've been convinced that there were benefits. So if you want to add a secret option that is, it's really a wrong tool, no one should use it, <laughs> guess you're allowed. So already seeing there's, you know, 35% of the audience is pointing towards a lack of awareness of the existence or the benefits or of nimble evaluations. Dean Johannes, do you want to comment on these results and also on the question itself? So I'm, I feel like the first one is, my prediction is, I, I, my hunch is the first one's winning because I feel like it encapsulates a few of those secondary ones for what it's worth. But I would. Um, Don't criticize our so survey. No, it's, it's okay. It's, not, it's, not, it's good to criticize it. Yes. It was done. <laughs> but you know, I, I want to actually backtrack on one thing I said, which seeing one of the things we were just talking about made me realize, along with the third one on here, which is, you know, it is true as an academic, if you run one little test of one little thing, that is hard to write a paper. 
Like it's, it, you're limited in terms of usually, not always, but usually you're limited because you don't have that much data. So you don't, there's a lot of the whys you don't know. It may be, you might want to run some secondary tests. So I think where, where there's huge promise for collaborations to get things out there in the general public is when it is iterative. And there is going to be, it's like, look, we're really going to tackle this problem about like, you know, some uh, health, you know, some, you know, um, I'm sorry, what was the example you used? Iron folic acid. Thank you. Um, and so we're really going to tackle this in a, in, a, in a more comprehensive way. And now we have a series of these nimble tests that we did. We did this, we learned that, we did this, we learned that. Now that's not an economist style writing. That's more of a public health style or a psychologist style paper, which is I think great. And we need to see more of that in economics where the paper says we're now going to report on a collection of six different tests that were done. This was done, then that was done, then this was done, and it's iterative. What you're, you're going to have a hard time getting an academic paper from is when you just do uh, like single, like just a single run, one test. Like the example I gave you from the video game thing we did, we did this thing. I had no idea what. I didn't think that was going to go to a paper. I didn't know maybe it would be a slide in a PowerPoint at some point in giving a talk. It was just running one little test at one little moment. I was a little curious what would happen, and you know. That was it, right? But it was not, I couldn't think about how I could ever write more than four paragraphs about what we tested, nonetheless a full paper. But, you know, if, but there would be more if we did iterative testing and really got into more, I mean, I'm not gonna, uh, about what that was. And so I think there is some element there where if it's a deep relationship and there's a commitment to a long goal of we want to create uptick in the following and we're going to have a one to two year collaboration doing a series of tests to try to figure out how to do that then that clearly has a match. It's when it's the one-off thing that doesn't. My question here is I do wonder how much of it is being done, but there's private science. You know, there are, um, you know, when you deal with the corporate world, obviously there are, there are corporations that do have in-house staff that do run these tests. Um, um, you know, I don't work with them when it's private science, that's me. Um, but they're there, you know, Amazon hires tons of people. They have, they're known for not sharing data, not sharing papers and things like that. Whereas there are some other firms that are known for allowing the data to get out there and allowing the test to be reported. So I do wonder whether there's a lot that we're seeing up here that's not because it's not being done, but because it's being done for private science purposes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the right, I don't know, I've never seen a survey to know what, how much of that is out there um, in that way. Do you want to respond something? Like I mean, respond now, but just, I guess, part of the reason why, and this is, this is maybe kind of due to the position I'm in, you know, as kind of a junior researcher who decided to get out of academia for God knows how long. Uh, but in, in, you know, most of the work, for example, I do is, is very much close to what I was describing earlier, which is closer to, to consultancy, capacity building, and, and catering to things where, you know, we're very clear. We do, we do write academic papers when we think that it fits with those objectives and, and we do stick to like the scientific rigor. You know, we agree with all of these things you're saying. Very often we're very conscious that the stuff we test is not gonna go to that type of academic paper. And that sometimes the, the, the difficulty is, you know, the type of outputs we have that we think are valuable for something that's different are not valued in an academic world. And so that kind of forces this, this almost division between, you know, like with your time, you have to choose to do one or the other. And, and so that, that forces this, this dichotomy between people who do this kind of, uh, you know, more consultancy type of economics and then the academic type of economics. And, and maybe that's particularly an early career. I don't know if it changes. But I don't know, and so it's, 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 I wonder if you're underselling the value of what you guys are doing, though, <laughs> in the sense that like maybe maybe that's true for like the very micro one-off test, mm -hmm. and maybe the answer is that we're not creating enough of a public good of a data repository, an experimental repository, mm -hmm. where all these little one-off tests, which you know, let's, uh, let's see the point of like saying an individual thing is not academically worthwhile, and that there's no grander lesson. But you know, I'm willing to bet that it's, like if you have 40 that are related to each other, all on a topic. Yeah. that a good academic could look at 40 tests all trying to move the needle on, on something, each one individually not being really very satisfying enough to want to dig, your, dig into, but 40 together might be. And so the, so the answer is, how are we aggregating up these results and making them easily accessible for, for the world so that researchers can see the 40, read the tests, understand the protocols, trust the protocols, and then, yeah. and then write guess, papers that weave it all together. Right. I guess picks up to the first thing. So we have a few minute, minutes left and there's quite a few audience questions. So I'd like to get into those right away. Could we project the highest voted one? 
It's qu question says the following. What are your key tips to address biases related to self-reported data? It's not there yet, but it's the question I can see it here. Sorry. The key tips to address biases related to self-reported data. Can one dive into it? I'll say, okay, I'll say three things. One is don't measure it, measure objective data. <laughs> Often there are substitutes, right? If you want to, you ask someone what's your roof worth and instead you could just observe the kind of roof they have and then figure out how much that costs. That's one option. Another is something called list randomization. Raise your hand if you've heard about that. That's okay, lots of people have, not everybody. So it's a way of getting people to give you information about uh, behaviors or experiences that might, they might not be happy to talk about directly, but you can elicit them indirectly. So you divide the sample into two groups. One group gets presented a list of maybe three things they might have done or experienced in the past week, innocuous things, uh, like visiting a friend or eating at a restaurant, and they tell you the number of things that they've done. Not which of them, but the number. The other half of the group gets shown the same list plus some sensitive item. You drank too much, or you, your husband was, was violent to, towards you. And again, they don't tell you which of those things they did, but the number. And so if you compare the means in those two groups, that's precisely the share of people who are implicitly telling you uh, that they've experienced that undesirable outcome, drinking, for example. So that's called dust randomization. Um, there's a, another technique that um, I proposed a, uh, with a couple of co-authors last year where you, um, you tell people what you want to hear and you use that to bound the influence of what's called experimental demand effect. So often what we worry about with these self-reports is that people are form a belief about what we want them to say as the experiment and then they act according to that belief, either because they want to be nice to us or uh, they want to have some misguided uh, sense about helping science. And so one way to bound how important these kinds of biases are is to just tell people outright what you want them to do and see how much that moves behavior around. So if you ask someone after giving them a cash transfer, how happy are you these days, you worry that they're just grateful to you and they want to say that they're very happy because they want to be nice to you. Now if you tell them, tell me how happy you are, and by the way, you do me a favor if you tell me that you're really, really happy. And compare that to the situation where you don't add that extra sentence. If that doesn't move behavior much, maybe you don't worry so much anymore about people biasing their response for you. Because if you outright tell them what you want them to do, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't make a difference. Um, Great. But maybe I'll stop there. Yep. I'd like sense? to combine the two highest voted questions right now. So we have a question about whether nimble evaluations work in non-digital environments. We already heard an example from yours, Johannes, if I'm not wrong, the bus example with the tablets, which was really a non-digital environment. And there's another question about selecting the right communication channels for the evaluation. Is it SMS, WhatsApp, WeChat, email? So I'd like to invite you to consider these questions together, right? Uh, how does this work in non-digital environments where there are different channels available there? And how do you choose the right digital or non-digital channel to go? about in a nimble evaluation, Dean? Um, so like which digital channel, in some sense, that's part of what a nimble evaluation would get at. Is like, you know, if it's really, like if operations doesn't know which method they want to use to reach their constituents, well, then you can set up a test and see which one is getting you better take up rates and things like this, and that's a question to ask. But that's really an operations question. And, and you know, in the context I work at least, I would always turn to the people in the field and say, well, you, you tell me how, what's the best way of reaching your constituents. Um, the non-digital, you know, yes, although do you remember that the minute you leave digital, you, you, you know, with the exception of what Johannes was talking about in terms of kind of like pre-RCT kind of design, design kind of work, um, if, you're, if you're actually running an RCT, but nimbly, and you're not digital, you, Probably not nimble. Like, because of the cost? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of, at least in my view, that's kind of part of the definition is that you need to be able to be, you know, fast and quick and cheap and, you know, ch cheap per observation. Um, obviously, maybe that's just semantics, but, you know, you know, if you do have large operations of people in the field selling things, 
Um, you know, you could imagine a nimble operation with, with Starbucks or something like this, or any sort of store where you kind of power something out across stores to put a little thing on the counter and then quickly see what's working, what's not, for getting people to like donate a dollar into the thing. So you can imagine things like that, they're non-digital, but, um, um, but so I mean, it doesn't have to be, but that's all. Can I, can I add something? Yeah. Because Please. I think this is something that, especially as we start working in countries that have less and less you know, a kind of digital infrastructure uh, is a question we've asked ourselves a lot because a lot of our work has been relying, you know, we go to governments and we say, we can do RCT cheaply, and then we enter a government where there's no digital data, and we're like, actually, we can't. And so we've thought about this a lot, and, uh, and this is interesting because it's a question that we've asked ourselves with our partners in Bangladesh a lot. And very often, so I totally agree with, with Dean, but very often people have more data than they think they have, and I think this is something that is, you know, something that I talk a lot about, a lot about on a daily basis. But you know, all these, and especially every government now is working on digitalizing services, making new platforms, getting people to use services online. All these things generate data. All these things offer opportunities for testing. All these things offer opportunities for learning. And, and very often people just you know, put out <coughs> those tools without putting in place the monitoring, the process evaluation kind of you know, tools and teams. And keep. So it's very much linked to capability, experience, and knowing what to do. But you know, um, the, anyone who's worked with me could testify that, you know, genuinely my, my biggest battle in life is why don't you just embed A-B testing every time you, do, you build a new digital, you know, public service and then just test how people want to test everything iteratively and you'll learn how to, you know, best put this together. So I guess for me the first thing is if you think you have a non-digital environment, first ask yourself actually maybe there's more data that's being created than I think. Um, that comment helps us to tie with the next and possibly the final question, which is the ad what advice would you have for organizations that are working with smaller data sets, smaller populations? How can they learn and improve? This time with what you just said, so like try and use channels that make the data readily available. But do you have more specific advice for that sort of organizations? And maybe I'll, I'll just tie into that latest question that's down there, which I find conceptually interesting. Is it really nimble just like doing small scale RCTs? No. no. Is no, there a difference? No. So, no, most nimble please. ones are larger scale. There you go. Smaller data. So it's administrative data, but larger sample sizes. Um, um, and what do you say to, to organizations that are working so, with small So for what it's sets. worth, that, it's that question that came out uh, uh, a few years ago at a gathering that actually led to Mary Kay Gugarty, who you mentioned, and me to write a book cool. together called Goldilocks Challenge. Um, and it was very much, you know, there was other things we cover in there, but part of the goal of that book was to try to um, try to speak to organizations that are not, uh, you know, not ready to do an RCT. They're not large enough, um, but they want they want to do well. And and part of the answer is, in 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 my view at least, to um, to recognize that look, you don't have the size for answering the impact question in, in a rigorous way. Like it's just not you can't you can't just create that out of thin air. Um, now, if you're not doing something that's genuinely innovative, so put two put in two different paths: are they innovative or are they not? Mm -hmm. right? And and I mean really, right? I don't mean what they call themselves, to be clear. <laughs> so because a lot of times everyone always thinks of what they do as unique, um, and yet when you turn around, of course, there's other things like that. Um, we're we're guilty of that too as researchers. You know, we think we have a new project; it's all exciting. We think it's unique, and then you. And then you wake up and you realize that four other people are working on the same thing, and that's great, it's good. But um, having said that, so you have unique and not unique in terms of innovative. If it's not unique, well then you might not need to be answering the impact question. You maybe should just be gathering better data about your operations. Are you doing what you said you would do? Are you, uh, are you, uh, are you implementing a program with high fidelity? Mm -hmm. And then there's other people who have done the rigorous RCTs on large scales, to show that programs that run at, X, at a certain level of fidelity will generate the following impacts. And if you're lined up and you're doing the things that um, you said you do in the right context, then that's fine. You don't need to measure impact. Um, and in fact, it would be a waste of resources. I would actually call it unethical to run a randomized trial on too small of a sample because that's money that you could be using to help people. And instead, you're using it on a really poor study that's not going to draw any robust conclusions at all. So I would put that below the bar on the ethical spectrum of should I do this or not. Um, on the innovative side, if it's innovative, 
but yet still too small scale, well then there's certainly good ways of documenting that innovation, documenting process changes taking place, helping to learn, and hopefully if it is truly innovative, then there is some path to scale, and then you know, use that early stage to get ready for figuring out, okay, let, we tinkered, we tinkered, we think we're onto something, there seems to be adoption of this program as we're offering it, the immediate changes that we're expecting to happen, happened, that doesn't mean we cause them to happen, but at least they're happening. If they don't happen, then we know we don't succeed. So we call that the shutdown rule. So it's when you, you do track to see, like, are the children getting bigger? If they're getting bigger, that doesn't mean you succeeded. But if they're not, well, you didn't succeed. That much we can tell you. And so you can track things like that and to get up to the hurdle of saying, okay, now we've figured out our operations. We think this actually has hope. We, you know, we're doing what we said we would do. We're having some short run changes occurring alongside what we're doing. Now let's get ready for a larger scale implementation and then research. So that's, I put it in those two piles. It's excellent. Well, we've unfortunately run out of time. But I'd like to ask if you'd like to close with a very brief, quest, uh, very brief comments. Johannes, Laura, anything else you'd like to add before closing? Me, yeah, I've done You're my good? prayer for A-B testing, so I'm done. <laughs> But your part, I couldn't get I've done my, pre my preaching, so I'm done. Well, I'd like to thank the speakers for their participation and you for being in the audience. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.